Welcome to America's Top Revisions. May this class be for Rafu Shalema, for Eliezer Raphael Leib Ben Emuna, and also for Maya Haim Ben Devora. Please click on the subscribe button to subscribe to us on the America's Top Revisions YouTube page, or click follow to follow us on your podcasting app so that you are the first to know when an inspiring new episode is posted. I am very happy to have on today's show, Representative Haya Rivka Zwolinski. Haya Rivka is a leading teacher of Rebbe Nachman of Breslov's Wisdom for Women in North America. She brings compassion and a deep understanding of psycho-spiritual trauma, transition, and growth to her lectures and workshops. Haya Rivka is taught in community centers, synagogues, schools, and other venues, as well as online to students on six continents. She is dedicated to bringing Breslov joy and inspiration to women through many channels, through many channels, through um, including her website, breslovwoman.org. Again, that's breslovwoman.org. And she is formerly the founding director of BRI Women, the first Breslov Research Institute program for women. And she has led trips for Jewish women to the Ukraine. Um, she also has she also has written books, including May You Have a Day, Making Every Day Better with the Techniques of Rebbe Nachman of Breslov. And she also wrote Mashiach, Hope for Turbulent Times. Wow, hi, Rifka, you've done so, so much. I'm so impressed. Thank you so much for being here. Please tell us more about yourself and what you do. So thank you. And Vera, I'm really happy to be here. And really, as I mentioned, just really touched and, and very impressed by your channel. I think it's a great idea. Okay. And really what you and I do isn't that different. Um, we reach out to women trying to share our own curiosity and our own inspiration with them. And over the past 20 years or so, my personal journey uh, became one that was very intense and very hopeful and very joyous with a lot of ups and downs. And I, through the process of Hispodidus, Hitpodidut, which you may know and which your viewers may know, which is talking in your own words to Hashem yes. about whatever is on your heart and on your mind, and through this process, I realized that my inclination to share what I'm learning and experiencing and how I'm growing with other women to give them the techniques and the, the uh, teachings of Rebbe Nachman so that they too can find some joy in their life. It's, it's really that simple. And it's so beautiful. I'm familiar with the Breslov teachings. And they, it's really all about joy. It's about living with Simcha Sahaim, like real, real joy, waking up in the morning with joy and just living with joy. And it's also really great because, you know, as you said, there are ups and downs in life and like people have challenges and the way that you approach your challenges makes all the difference. And when you can approach something with, you know, with, with faith and Amunah and Bitahon and Hashem and a joy, it makes so much difference. It, uh, you're absolutely right. It makes a big difference. I had spent my whole life previously thinking I was searching for truth, which I was. I wouldn't say I wasn't. But when I found truth, I realized there was still something missing. And that is Simcha. Because if you have truth, which automatically means you have Amuna, you have faith, and you have Tachon, you have trust in Hashem. If you have these things without Simcha, you don't really have those things because it's a rejection of everything that Hashem has given you in your life, where he's planted you and what he's exposed you to and the ways in which he wants you to grow. It's, it's like a, a, an obstacle course. And you, you have to be prepared with all those things plus joy. Plus joy. I love it. I love it. So today we're going to be offering a tremendous resource to many women who are really struggling with relationships of all types. We'll be addressing how to heal our relationships based on the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. And I know that you have said in your own words, what do we want? We want to feel less pain and more optimism to be happy and to lead meaningful lives. And this all requires healthy relationships. It really, it really does. And if we learn, share, and live his teachings, Rebbe Nachman gives us real practical tools to improve all of our relationships, our relationship with Hashem, our relationship with ourselves, and our relationship with each other. It's really, really amazing. 
And this is so profound and so true. And most women I know struggle with at least one, if not more of these relationships in their lives. For some, it's with their husband. For others, it's with their children. And other women struggle in their relationships with their parents or their friends or even their coworkers. And some of them struggle with all of the above, which is really, really hard. Um, so I, I want to start off with some perspective. Can you please share with us some of Ruby Nachman's viewpoints on relationships and their important role that they play in our lives? So Rebbe Nachman actually says that um, that in the Aleph Bet book, he says that our relationships is something we all want. We would rather not live than not have loving relationships with friends and families. That's how important it is and central it is. When we think of Rebbe Nachman, we don't necessarily think about this, but it was absolutely central to his worldview because he understood the confluence of all of those three areas of relationships that you mentioned and that I like to, to really focus on, which is our relationship with each other, of course, our relationship with Hashem, of course, but very profoundly our relationship with ourselves. We can't have one of that triumvirate missing and expect the pieces to fall into place. Now, the, the Rebbe also, he points out to us that um, we are all, we are all in, in, uh, in throughout our relationships engaged in one form or another at one point in time or another of projection. Now he doesn't use that word. That's a modern 20th century psychological term. But what it means that whatever's going on inside you, and it can be positive and it could be not so positive, that is what we are projecting onto the other, the other person. Yes. And the other person becomes a mirror for us. And his great grandfather, the Baal Shem Tov, spoke about this as well. And in order for us to have healthy relationships, we have to be able to project the positive because in truth, in truth, most people, most of the time project the negative. They may not admit it. They may not admit it to themselves. We have all done it. Vera, I'm sure you've done it. Yes. Okay, we have something going on. We think that person's cheap. We think that person's jealous. We think that person has an anger issue. But very often, if we look in the mirror and again, make the time for Hispotidus, we can figure out that this is related to something going on inside us. And Rebbe Nachman's most famous lesson on the topic, on the topic of relationships, on the topic of what we see in other people is called Azamra. And it's Lukote Maran 282 for anyone who's interested. It's a foundational lesson in Breslov. And it's very much about training ourselves with our thoughts to look for the good in other people and, and in ourselves. There are two components to that. And it's so fascinating because he's not saying look for the good in other people and positivize them. Don't say, oh, wow, you know, you're such a generous person and rush to tell the person you're such a generous person. He's not saying don't do that, but he's not saying do that. What he's saying is, is focus on changing your thoughts and your perception. And that's where real change occurs. Why? Because our thoughts are our most sublime faculty. They're our most heavenly spiritual faculty, okay? That we have speech, we have action. These things are at various distances from the spiritual world, action more so than speech, speech more so than thought. So when we look at other people and we use our powers of perception to see the good in them, everything changes. But, but I wanna just very quickly give a caveat we don't necessarily and we won't necessarily always see an external change in the relationship. We may, very often we do, but not always. But that is not a sign that the change isn't important and the perception isn't important. That's so interesting. I, I have to take this in for a second because it really, it really is powerful because it's all, it's a game of perspective. It's a game of perspective in your head. It's so powerful because, you know, you tra we're training ourselves to think 
to look at other people with an eye and tove and to see the positive in them, which can be a little bit challenging if we're in a challenging relationship with a challenging person. You know, it's not so, if a person is nice and sweet, it's easy, but with a more challenging situation, it's harder, but it's still there. It doesn't mean it's not there. It's still there, that, that positive quality. But also what even struck me even more than that is that you were saying not only look for the positive quality in the, in the other person, to look for the positive quality in ourselves also, because it's very, very important because a lot of people, you know, the way that we perceive ourselves, we kind of tend to project that onto other people. So we're, if we're not seeing the good in ourselves. A lot of times we're seeing, like you said, a mirror, like we're seeing that negative quality or that thing that we don't like about ourselves in the other person, which makes us perceive the other person in a negative manner. It's, it's yes. kind of like a loop. It, yes, it's like a loop. And, and the, the truth is it isn't always exactly a match. You may have an issue that you're working on and you see something negative in someone else and you just don't see the connection. But in general, we are required we are actually required, al pi halacha, really, to be dan l'chavzchus. And that means, it, it means, we say it means give the benefit of the doubt, but it means literally to judge someone on the side of merit, to make a judgment, okay? And this really cannot stand if you can't do this for yourself. If, if you're unable to do this for yourself, there's a broken link there because you have to be standing firm. As a matter of fact, when Reb Nussin, Reb Nachman's um, leading Talmud and scribe and, and great Rav in his own right, and just, just an amazing, amazing master of everything Breslov, when he, when the Rebbe left this world, Reb Nussin was still teaching and yet he would teach Azamra always, this particular lesson again and again and again. There are hundreds of lessons of Rebbe Nachman. Yet this was the one he would keep saying again and again. As a matter of fact, he would tell everyone to go with this lesson. And many Breslovers carried around in their purses or their pockets to remind themselves of the importance, the foundational nature of judging yourself on the good. Don't micro, micro scope and pick apart the good things you do, just like you shouldn't with other people. Some people are naturally harder on themselves. Some people are naturally harder on others. Throughout our lifetimes, this can change, sometimes with a particularly frustrating child going through a difficult period that can change uh in a marriage that can change with friends this can change but suffice it to say that we all pick things apart and the Rebbe says specifically don't pick things apart just look at the good that's it that's all you have to do and with your thoughts you can literally change your reality because whatever you focus on that is what you're going to create and attract that's basically the, the gist of Azamra. Wow. So what you focus on is what we're, go we, what we're going to attract. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they just discovered this in the secular world 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Okay. But this has been known in, in Judaism, obviously, since the beginning. And Rebbe Nachman and, and the Baal Shem Tov, but Rebbe Nachman very much spoke about this quite a bit and the importance of treating your thoughts like horses. And if they go one pull one way or the other, he's not the only one who said this, but if they pull one way or the other, rein them back in. And we all, he says, many people, we go to bed at night, we lie in bed. We're supposed to be saying Shema again and again until we fall asleep, but we're lying in bed and we're thinking about our day. And we're thinking the conversation we had with our neighbor. And that annoying conversation we had with our neighbor. And she said this, and I should have said this. And, you know, this is, and she's really out to get me. And the Rebbe speaks about this. He says, and people lie in bed at night and think that this person wants to harm them or out to get them. And what we are doing is we are fomenting conflict with our thoughts. You can be sure that the next time you wake, you, you run into that person, there will be conflict. So don't do it. <laughs> say the Shema again and again don't go there and the Rebbe it's so interesting the Rebbe isn't just asking us this is really important and it's a technique and it's it's easy to get 
He's not asking us to not think of something. That's very hard type of Musr to do. The truth is it's difficult. What he's saying is, is think of something else because you can't hold two thoughts in your head at the same time. So instead of thinking of what she did and blah, 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 think of something positive she did. If you can't, because you may have a, a neighbor who whatever, or whatever it is, I'm giving a neighbor just because it's a, a non-intensive personal thing. And you may find that you can think of many good things about her, or maybe you can't. So think about something else entirely. Think about something good. And that will replace the something that is not good. Use thought replacement. Use your innate power. Wow. And I like the way that you say our innate, our innate power, because it's true. We really do have innate power as human beings. Our thoughts are inside of our head. Nobody's controlling our thoughts. Nobody's going into our heads. We're in control of our thoughts. And it's, it's such a power. And I don't think people realize that, but it's such a power to have control over your thoughts so we can choose to think about the good thing. And you're right. I mean, I have to identify like that. Sometimes I think about a situation, a challenge, a person, and I'm thinking over and over in my head, and it's not positive. Sometimes I'm having an argument with a person in my head, you know, and what am I going to say? What are they going to say? It does nobody any good. It doesn't do me any good. It doesn't do the other person any good. It does nothing. If I could just, if I can't think of anything good about that person in particular at that time, just think about something else completely altogether. Nothing, not even related. Exactly. As a matter of fact, I have, I go so far as to have, um, verses of Tehillim ready to say I have um I have prayers bookmarked in um in Lakute Tefillos the 50th gate in English Reb Nassim's prayers based on Rebbe Nachman's lessons I I myself weaponize myself in this area because I like everyone else I can all too easily spiral and I'm not saying I never spiral I do but it's something to work on and you know I'll tell you something very you said something really important and you said it off the cuff and I want to tell you, not everybody believes we can control our thoughts and that our thoughts are ours. You, you obviously believe that, which is great. I, I do a lot of coaching and I can honestly say that most women, if maybe all, if not at least the majority of women that we begin this process of sorting these things out, come to me. Most of them do not know where their thoughts come from. They think their thoughts are just something that's just flying in their heads and that they're, you know, and that they can't control them. And I've worked with people with phobias and anxiety and depression and, and personality disorder issues. And they really believe that, that they're stuck because they're at the mercy of their thoughts. And Rebbe Nachman says, you are not at the mercy of your thoughts. It's an illusion of the Yetzer. Hara. Ah, he's sneaky. That Yetzir Hara, I'm going to tell you, it's so sneaky. He yeah. comes in in ways that you would least expect it, that you wouldn't even think. A hundred percent. That's right. That's right. I mean, but there are so many women walking around with so much hurt and pain. I mean, they're suffering in their struggle in relationships. They have tried so, so hard to mend their relationships, but they're still struggling all the effort they have put in seems to be in vain. But the bottom line is that we all want deeply to be happy, to be in functional, fulfilling relationships. But we don't always know how to make it happen. It's just the truth. So I want to see if you can please give us just some practical tools that we can put into place today in order to heal our relationships and live more meaningful lives. So that's a, that's a great question. And um, I, I would like to refer back to the beginning where I mentioned that very often we can see a a real, um, a, a real actualized change in our relationships just from changing our thoughts. And then sometimes we can't because the external expression, there are times in lives where relationships unfortunately may have to end. There are times in life, our lives where relationships just drift apart. And then there are those central relationships that we want to keep working on. So the, the idea is, I'll, 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 I'll tell you, actually, I'll tell you a personal story. I wasn't going to do this, but it's hearing the question really makes me think I should. Um, there's someone, somebody I've known over the years, and I don't know why she pushes my button. She's a great person. Whatever, we, we don't have the greatest click. And um, for whatever reason, I was having a really hard time with her and I 
was like, how could you, uh, how could you not at least devote some time in Tefila and his photos to this issue? Because really, the issue is you. So I went. This was um, not all that long ago. A couple of years ago, I went. I made. I really devoted like an hour to this, and it, it just came to me. I, I'm not only not practicing this. I'm, I don't love this person. This is not a Havas Yisrael. I may give it lip service, but I don't feel it. And I felt this intense healthy shame. I'm going to call it a healthy shame because it motivated me to change. And I begged Hashem to help me feel love for this person who pushes my buttons. And I really just begged Hashem. And this feeling of peace came over me through a lot of tefillah. It was, it was an hour. And I get done. And I just felt so hopeful. A minute later, the phone rings. It's her. And she said to me, she picks up the phone. She says, hi, Rivka, in all the time I've known you, I have never thanked you for all the help you've given me. And it just occurred to me that I've never thanked you at all. And I really need to say thank you to you. Oh, my this God. Is really <laughs> story. This is my personal story, so I can tell it. But I know women who've done this with their children, for sure, who've done this with their children, just Davening, help me, not help me, not help the person change, not help the relationship get better. Help me see the good in them. Help me just love them. And they've seen incredible changes, changes from a child who was um, a, a child who was really having difficulties, was very aggressive and, and not able to deal with the system. And there's flaws in the system. It's true to a child who's now just like the top of the top, all through his mother just saying, I need to change. I need to change the way I see this child. Hashem helped me love this child for who he is. That's it, so simple. I'm not gonna say it happened overnight with her. My story was a minute. Her story was a couple of years, but it happened. Wow. So, so there, so there we combine the thought, the power of positive thought, and the power of prayer together. Yes, and that's incredible because sometimes you just feel like you can't do it yourself. You can't have those positive thoughts for whatever reason you're struggling, then just not coming, and you need help. You need help with your own positive thoughts in yes. your own head, and that's what we're asking Hashem for. And just to, His bow to do is just is prayer in your own words. You just pray to Hashem, not from a sitter, but in your own words. Just pour out your thoughts, pour out your feelings. Ask for Hashem to help you see this person more positively, have a more positive yeah. outlook toward them. And that, as you said, it could be very, very powerful in terms of your relationship with that person. And not overnight. I mean, with you, it was, uh, that's like an amazing that's just story. One instance, yes, right. yes. But normally for most people, it takes time. But over time, there, there, will be, there will be results from that. Because you know what it is? It's you're refining yourself. When you're doing his bow to do, you're refining yourself. Yeah. And some people, Hashem may need some more people to spend more time refining themselves, you know? So then they're the, for the need for more prayer. Yeah, absolutely. And you articulated something that I, I didn't, which is very uh, insightful and important. And that is, is we don't have to do this alone. We absolutely don't. We, you know, we feel, oh, I have to change. Have to, okay, let's say you accept the fact you're flawed. Okay, now I have to work on myself. But you can't do it all alone. Who can you rely on? You can only rely on Hashem. Hashem's the one that makes everything happen. Ultimately, ultimately, at the, at the deepest level, Hashem makes everything happen, even, even if we have free will. It's a paradox. It's a conundrum. Rebbe Nachman says, don't go there because your head will explode. But we do have Bechira. We do have the ability to choose to do the right thing. But at the same time, Hashem ultimately decides what happens. And therefore, we need to rely on him. And I, I mean, I think what happens is, is people go and we all want a Yeshua. We all want a salvation. We go, we say, Hashem, just take this thing away. Take this problem away. Who yes. doesn't? Of course, when we should daven like that. But there's something deep. Hashem, let me learn what I need to learn from this. Hashem, let me strengthen myself from this. Hashem, help me look at this in a new light, this situation. And all of that 
is what we're supposed to get out of the situation anyway, because really our suffering and God, I don't want to hear anybody suffering. Nobody should ever have to suffer, but we all do. And we all do relative to who we are. Right. And no one's suffering is necessarily any greater than anyone else's. It's really your perspective. But I think what happens is, is we forget that Hashem is the one that is sending us the suffering to begin with. We don't always know the reason. Sure, it could be a kapara, it could be an atonement, it could be a tikkun, whatever. But ultimately, the reason is, is to draw us to turn to him. We've got to turn to him. And there are simplistic ways of doing it. And everybody's different. But if we turn to him and say, help me, Abba, help me, Tati, I'm really stuck. I don't see anything good about this situation. Help me see some light in this situation. That's doing a Zamra on the situation, not just looking for the good in the other person or in yourself, but on the situation itself. Wow. Right. To see the bright part of the situation, to see the light there, to see the benefits. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, um, so, so, okay. Um, I have an interesting question. <laughs> As women, we put in a tremendous amount of effort into our relationships and we work on refining our character traits, making ourselves more physically fit and attractive. We work on being better mothers, being better wives, daughters, friends, employees, employers. We really, we really, for the most part, do work on ourselves. And this is saying that it takes two to tango. So, however, quite often we are doing the tango by ourselves and it feels like there's nobody there. If, so I mean, is it enough? The question is really, is it enough? Is it enough if we're the only ones working on our relationship, on any relationship? And I know that many women out there feel that they have done so much to improve their relationships, but the other people involved are not working as hard or maybe not even working at the relationship at all. Can a person change the state of a relationship and heal it even if they're the only one making the effort. And I know that we've talked a little bit about this, but I wanted to see if maybe we can get into it a little bit more because this is something real that many women struggle with. So it's maybe the most common question I get asked. So it's a very important question. Okay, I'm doing everything, yeah. but it's not changing. Yes. And, it, you know, uh, we all struggle with this and we can only do so much sometimes. But one of the, again, going back to this theme of really getting in touch with ourselves is understanding that the same Hashem who gives us this difficult relationship is the same Hashem who has the answer for it. And the answer, answer unfortunately, is not always external. I, I want to say something really important. Um, there's a for women, there's a line of accepting a difficult situation when you're strong enough to accept it in a healthy way. Many women will just submit to, a, God forbid, abusive situation, okay? Because we have to draw a line here. Yeah, I, I'm not calling everything abuse, but a really difficult situation. They will submit to it because they think that's a religious requirement. Yes. Yeah. Um, th that's just not true. Um, we have to be able to know ourselves in order to figure out what we are supposed to be doing with a fractious relationship. So with a relationship that more peripheral to our lives, maybe a work situation that's slightly abusive or toxic or difficult, yeah, we could quit, maybe. Or maybe we could just develop such inner strength that it truly, we are impervious to the difficulty. We understand that it's from Hashem and that the nature of the relationship isn't something that we necessarily can change because that person isn't going to change. It happens. We also have much closer relationships and this is where it gets really personal and each case is different because for the most part, people feel put upon and hurt. They feel they've done everything for a relationship, but they really, really hate to say it, but they really haven't. What they've done is a whole bunch of actions, okay, that they feel are going to change the other person. Yes. Okay. And 
you said something before about our thoughts and the power of thoughts. We can only change ourselves. That's it. That's it. We do not have control over another person's behavior, their thoughts, their feelings, what they say. We only have control over ourselves. And our, our reactions to these things can be honed and turned into responses, which is a very different level of dealing with negative external stimuli, okay? And for women who struggle with, I'm, I'm gonna just assume we're, we're talking about family relationships because they're often the most painful. Yeah. For women who are struggling with these things, again, I would really encourage, you know, to fill a, a lot, a lot of prayer, but not the kind of prayer like fix that person. But the kind of prayers let me focus on the good in that person. Very often, people will see external changes in this way. Not always. Not always. And you have to choose to either make your peace with that or move on. And, you know, I, 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 I do think that there are tips and tricks for communication and so on and so forth. But if someone is not motivated in the same way you are, the only option you have is tefillah and the Zamra. Those are the two options. Wow. But you know what? It's good that we have options. It's not yeah. like, okay, give up. Everything's hopeless. Forget it. No, we have tefillah and Zamra. Tefillah, praying to Hashem and, and Zamra. Like, help me please see the good in the situation, in myself, in the other person. It's really, really powerful. And it's not nothing. You know what I mean? That's it's right. That's right. If I made it sound like nothing, I didn't mean no, to. No, 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 it's really no, no. everything. Yes, that's what I meant. I meant, you know what, because the reason that I was saying that is because like normally you think, oh, what can I do? What can I, can I take another class in communication? Can I say things better? Can I use I statements? Can I dress nicely? Like right. think the external, like that's what I meant, you know, but this is really, this is what it is. This is the meat of the situation that's a fill and the Azamra. And it's, it's even more something than anything external that we can do. Yes. I mean, and I'm not saying that the external isn't is useless. God forbid, no, we no, don't need to make changes externally as well. Yes, but but you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I I see so many, as you said, so many women suffering, and relationships may be the primary cause of suffering for women. I'm with you. That's, that's how it is. Yes, and you know, the, sometimes it's surprising that the extent to which even the slightest challenge with somebody that's not really in central to your life can cause a woman anguish. Yeah. And again, all of this is so that we look at ourselves and not look at ourselves like I'm no good, but look at ourselves like I'm a holy neshama. I have to look at the good myself. And yeah, you know, Rabbi Nachman, when he, he spoke about this great wave of immorality and atheism that was going to flood the world. And well, I think we see it. It's everywhere. But he also called this a wave of atheism. And the wave of atheism, we understand it to mean, we have the tradition, understand it to mean that it's also not just atheism where you don't have faith in Hashem. We see that all over the world. But atheism where you don't have faith in yourself. You don't believe that you have the power to grow and change and be happy. And you don't believe that you are connected to Hashem in such a way he created you for a specific purpose. And that purpose isn't to sit here and suffer. That purpose is to overcome all these difficult, painful situations through Simcha, through being joyful. It's so wonderful. And it gives so much hope. Thank you. Um, and I know that you had shared a story earlier before uh, about, you know, you davening. I, I loved it. And I, I so love hearing anecdotes and personal stories because I feel like personal examples of the concepts that we talk about in the podcast really help to solidify the concept. You know, it helps to bring it home. So today we are talking about healing relationships based on the wonderful teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. So I want to see if there are any other stories that you can share with us, either from your personal life or from the life of something you know, where Rabbi Nachman's teachings were su su successfully put into place and the end result was a happy turnaround in a relationship. So I can. 
I, I can do that. I, I shared the story of the, a specific mother with her child. I kept it very generous. I general, excuse me. Yeah. Um, and I also would like to talk briefly about um, Kamsa Vibar Kamsa. Okay. Because that's a relationship story. And I'd like to give it an imagined ending. Okay. All right. Is that okay with you? Please. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Because I don't want to, you know, it's hard sometimes to talk about people that I've, you know, coached or whatever, because I don't want to necessarily For identify sure. them. For sure. So, so we're coming up to the three weeks and we all know the story, but I'm going to give it a brief of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. A very wealthy man had a party in the second temple period and he wanted to invite um he wanted to invite someone and his ministers got the wrong guy they got kamsa not bar kamsa or bar kamsa not kamsa and they and the wealthy man wouldn't let him into the party even though he had an invitation he humiliated him in a room full of strangers and he was so humiliated that he sought revenge and he went out and he went to the Caesar at the time, the Roman emperor, and he said, the Jews are plotting against you. And without going into the whole story, I encourage everyone to look up the story. If they don't know it, it's from the Talmud, but it's very famous. Um, he was the cause through his way of casting a negative light on the Jews. He was the cause of the destruction of the second base of Mekdash. Now, the lesson that we are taught to have from this story is that the rabbanim, the rabbis are held responsible for not protesting that this guy was humiliated. They didn't protect his honor. They didn't protect his dignity. And the moral of the story is we should protect everyone else's honor and dignity because when we don't, what does it lead to? The destruction of Hashem's dwelling place on earth. Okay, this is a very important story for this time. We all know it. However, I always think about this story and I always think about what if I was the one who walked into a party and was humiliated in this way? Okay. Yeah. Rebbe Nachman says that preoccupation with honor and with dignity Okay, and getting respect. This preoccupation is sent to people to keep them busy so they forget to serve Hashem. From the Etahara again. Of course. Oh, such a sneaky one. <laughs> such a sneaky one because who could say, what's wrong with getting a little honor? I did a good thing. Should I be honored? But the Talmud tells us something else. Okay. It tells us that when uh, that the honor is, is and dignity are craved by people who have very little dust. Okay. The Talmud says that this is women. Okay. We can discuss that. I don't know that, that, that we necessarily are that he does, but that for a woman, honor and dignity are very, very important. A woman, a slight to a woman's honor, if she's not preparing for this, can feel like a dagger in the heart. I agree. All right. And many women have a problem letting go of this. I personally know people who have held a grudge and a resentment over this for decades. 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 Crazy. Okay. So one of the things that Rebbe Nachman taught me, which I, I, if I could just have maybe the biggest thanks in the world is for this is that when we let go of our need to be honored by others, that just takes us to the next level. And that improves all our relationships when we can look away from the slight and an affront to our dignity. And he, he valued this quality so much, Rabbi Nachman valued it so much that his daughter, Sarah, once received a letter from her father. She was considered to be a tzedekah. She had Ruach HaKodesh. She was at a very high level. And in this level, in this letter, he praised her and he gave her honor. And she broke down in tears. And she said, oh no, 
oh no, my father thinks that I need to be given some honor and respect because I've fallen from my spiritual level. Oh, interesting. Now, to answer your question, I did it in a roundabout way, but to answer your question, again, I'm not talking about where the line is drawn with abuse. We really have to, that's a case by case. It has to be discussed in detail. It's, it's outside the scope of this conversation we're having today. But let's assume it's not anything particularly abusive. Where, where we can make and see incredibly positive changes is when we let go of the need to be treated with honor and respect, no matter who we are. And when we let go of that, what we find is, is that the other person lets go of it too, because that's a main point of contention between people. Yes, for sure. Wow. It's that honor respect. That's so interesting that that, that would be what, what causes that, you know, nobody wants an affront to their dignity. I don't think anybody does. I think we all have pride and, you know, respect for even a modicum of ourselves, you know, and to have somebody else, try to take that away or to actually take that away. It could really, like you said, be a dagger in our heart. So, but to remove that, to, to remove any desire of wanting such honor and dignity and respect, we really can improve relationships because then we're not affronted so much. It takes That's away, right. right. takes away that struggle. That's right. I mean, obviously with children, you have to teach them to show honor and respect because the honor and respect that they show you is really the covet Hashem. You're teaching right. them how to honor Hashem. Right. But with other people, um, you know, when people are very, I, I tend to trust people more who are less concerned with titles and status and da 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 da. da. It's, I'm not saying that there's anything necessarily wrong with that. That has its place as well. But when somebody can dispense with that in order to be real and, and be who they are, that is a really great gift. And, you know, it, we women are so sensitive a lot of women are very sensitive as i mentioned we can hang on to these things for years one of the things that you 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 wanted a, an anecdote but one of the things that i can recall seeing is, a, is somebody in a marriage who had a just hung on to something her husband said and did really almost 20 years ago and through really learning a lot of Rebbe Nachman's teachings on Kavod, she was able to realize that this was her issue. She was able to let go with it, let go of it. And literally it was like all the friction just fell away. Amazing. It, it wasn't coming from him anymore. It wasn't coming from her anymore. It, because that was the nut of the issue for this particular situation. Wow. It's so. amazing. It's amazing. Wow. <laughs> we learned so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Haya Rivka, for joining us on, on America's Top Rebbitsons. We really, really did learn a lot today. And may all our learning be in the merit of a Rafua Shalema for Eliezer Raphael Le Benemuna and also for Meyer Hayim Ben Devora. Thank you so, so much. Amen. Thank you, Vera. Thanks. Thank you.